Hi guys, welcome back to the Revive Stronger podcast. I'm your host, as always, Steve Hall. And today we have another exciting episode where we're diving deep into the world of muscle growth, exploring the intricate balance between training intensity, volume, and for the ultimate pursuit of muscle hypertrophy. Join us as we unravel the science behind optimal training strategies and provide you the practical tools to maximize your muscle growth. In this episode, I am joined by Mike Isretel, Eric Helms, and Zach Robinson as we embark on a journey to answer some thought-provoking questions, including have you ever wondered about the advantages of pushing your sets to momentary muscular failure is it the golden ticket to unlocking gains or are there strategic reasons for not programming that way every time does the elusive stimulus to fatigue ratio transform under certain conditions we'll explore the dynamic nature of this ratio within different training phases workouts exercise positions and even dive into the intricate relationship between set volume load and proximity to failure And for all the coaches out there, discover effective ways to guide your clients in regulating relative intensity and volume. Plus, learn how these experts decide on how they get to the right starting intensity and volume for training and how they fine-tune these variables over time. Stay tuned for a knowledge-packed episode that might just redefine the way you approach your workouts. So let's jump right in. Hi guys, welcome back to the Revive Stronger podcast. I'm your host, as always, Steve Hall. And today I have a very, very exciting roundtable. I have Eric Helms, Mike Isretel, and Zach Robinson on the show. And we're going to be talking about all things proximity to failure. And I think these are some fantastic people to have on the show to discuss this because I think everyone here has thought about it on a very deep level past just even just practically doing it or just looking at it within studies they've thought about it maybe more than a lot of people on this planet are probably in the top one percent so uh in episode 369 i discussed zach's recent meta regression which i think is maybe kind of good listening to have before you come into this there's zach's also been on loads of different podcasts so hopefully you've caught one of those Uh, but definitely really listen to that one if you haven't And just to kind of frame the discussion, I wanted to talk about some of the kind of previous data that we had that I think people would be aware of where we didn't seem to see much additional benefit of training to failure than a few reps shy of failure for hypertrophy. Martin Ruffalo came on the podcast and we talked about his meta analysis where he found no significant or meaningful benefit for training to failure versus not. So keeping kind of like proximity to failure. Whereas Zach's meta regression, uh, still in preprint actually, uh, found an exponential increase in hypertrophy as we approached momentary muscular failure for moderate loads. And uh, it included more studies and looked at proximity to failure as a continuous variable, not binary like Martin's did. So uh, this is just one variable to consider, obviously amongst many, which is what we're going to be discussing today. But it may have shifted some perspectives, uh, it seems to, within the online space and people are thinking about it. And so I wanted to kind of dig into that a little bit deeper. I don't know if, Zach, you have anything you wanted to kind of embellish there or add? Yeah, no, I think that's obviously it's a it's a great kind of interlude to kind of touch on. Um, I think the the biggest thing that I just like to talk about every time we talk about the meta regression is just and you know see we hammered home this 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 point but it's just good to kind of reiterate just how unstable the the kind of the relationship was in terms of the way that it actually looked. I think there was quite a bit of overinterpreting on the exact like comparisons between RARs and extrapolating the differences in effect size and all these different calculations that you can you can do but personally having done this with all the different steps that kind of went into the to the actual process of estimating those relationships i would just be careful on doing those to me what the meta regression suggests which does if you look at the actual numeric effect sizes from pretty much every other meta-analysis there does seem to be some sort of advantage on taking sets closer if not all the way to failure the question is the degree to which that's the case and how do we balance that with all the other factors that we can look at in the training program. So I think that's just the thing I would underline and not necessarily overinterpret the exact shape of the relationship. As you mentioned, the, the, the meta regression is still in uh, a preprint um, formally, and we are going to make some, some minor adjustments that may kind of sh- shape and shift things a little bit different as we head uh, towards publication. But um, that's kind of just the the one piece of caution I, I'd say is that that's kind of what we're talking about today is that there does seem to be some sort of benefit. And I think that kind of is, is uh, reflected in pretty much all of the analyses um, that have been done on this topic, whether binary, continuous, etc. It's just the the degree to which that's the case, and then also balancing that with all the other training variables that we have to manage when we're designing a program for hypertrophy. Fantastic. I don't know if Eric or Mike, you have anything you wanted to add uh, 
uh, within that. No, I, I think nope. uh, Zach did a great job kind of teeing that up and, and, and laying the, the limitations up front, which is, I think, is always a really appreciative thing that, that he does. Mike? Yeah, Nothing. no, I think it's cool. great. There's tons of other caveats to make, but that's that's just the the big one. Sure, perfect. So, yeah, to frame the discussion, uh, we're looking to discuss though. Uh, sorry, to discuss how those seeking to maximize hypertrophy should be approaching their training intensity or proximity to failure or training to failure, and to hopefully provide a bit of a framework for where intensity falls amongst other variables like volume uh, and practical tools to maybe be able to modulate it for uh, your average trainee. And I guess a good place to start with you, Eric, is do you agree there are advantages to taking sets to momentary muscular failure? Uh, and if you do, why wouldn't you always program to take every set to momentary muscular failure? Great question. And I think um, what is reasonably clear uh, is that there's a directionality here if we're looking at the uh, the effect of a set. And really this comes down to directionality being that the closer you get to failure, I think it's pretty clear that that set will be more stimulative. Um, and the, the big question here, and I think what we need to acknowledge with all these analyses is where do we zoom in? And at what point do we take a bigger picture view? At what point do we start looking at the forest of the trees? Um, and I think prior to this meta regression, we had a pretty good understanding that, hey, you know, going to failure is going to ensure you've maximally stimulated everything you can on that set, but your subsequent set will suffer, but your subsequent exercise will suffer. And hey, maybe even your next day of training, depending on your frequency, volume, uh, how well you recover, you know, how long you've been training and, and are these novel exercises and your own kind of genetic uh ability to, to recover from damage and train and benefit from it, that may even impact subsequent microcycles and, and, and days. And maybe you have to deload too frequently. So basically, our prior perception was that the more we zoomed out, um, the more that seemed to be less of an unambiguously good thing, right? Oh, more stimulating set, great. And I would say what may have changed from this meta regression is that um, the impact may not be necessarily so negative, or we would expect it to be popping up in some of these studies. Um, it's one thing to look at acute data and go, yeah, it increases time course of recovery if we train to failure versus not. Uh, yeah, it's subjectively more challenging. Um, yeah, there's all these, you know, these issues related to recovery. But if that's a problem, then shouldn't it mean less hypertrophy? And I think that's a reasonable position to take. But then the big one, and this is the only other caveat that I would add to what uh, Zach brought up is that we can only make inferences on the types of training programs that have been meta analyzed and that have been done. And the vast majority of studies, actually, prior to Zach's uh, meta regression, if you looked at all the prior meta analyses, all of the studies that have been meta analyzed, they trained only two or three days per week, which is 50% of what most people do. And that's not a perfect proxy for, for volume or stimulus, but it's not a bad one either. Um, there's only so much you can do in one session in a lab, in a lab setting, logistical feasibility. So we can say with confidence that yes, if you're training about half as much as the people who are really interested in actually going to true momentary muscular failure, which are almost exclusively like hardcore lifters, um, and for this podcast, especially, I'm pretty comfortable that we're talking to a lot of like recreational and competitive bodybuilders. So for, for you, dear listener, um, if you're someone who's training twice as much as these meta analyzed data points, then it is a bit of a leap to say your training would be better if we took it to failure. And I think that's a big caveat. Uh, if we look at the sets that were performed in, the, in, the, in, in this research, and there's a great, you know, figure one out of Zach's paper. We're looking at what I would probably describe as low to moderate volume training with a low frequency for the most part, uh, both low frequency of number of times you're in the gym and then maybe a low to moderate frequency of per muscle group per week. So while I can say I'm confident that in that context, you might get more out of training closer to failure uh, if we just kind of broad brush that, I think the... It's, it's, it's pretty unclear if someone is coming from a paradigm of, let me see how frequently and how much I can train muscles. 
and um, that might change that relationship. But to throw a question back on the whole group, one thing that I've been considering based upon this meta-analysis is that I think my framing previously was volume is very important for hypertrophy. And when other variables negatively impact volume, at that point, that trade-off might not be worth it. At this point, I'm open to the idea, and this is a, probably the biggest shift in my mindset. I'm not saying I fully made that tick over because we haven't actually really analyzed the direct interaction of volume and intensity. But I'm open to the idea that perhaps what we should start with is the idea of actually I'm going to train at a pretty high intensity, perhaps higher than we would have earlier, and then see how long it takes me to recover from low to moderate amounts of volume, and then the time course of recovery, and build my frequency and the volume around a relatively high intensity approach, rather than I'm going to try to get an appropriate volume and then modulate my intensity to allow me to get that, um, which I think, you know, as much as people have probably seen like the classic is Rattel Helms all duke it out, punch each other in the face, you know, Godzilla versus Mothra uh, battles. Um, most of the time we're on the same page, I think from that paradigm, even if we have a different approach to when it goes up and when it goes down in the, period, in the periodization of it. So I, I'm actually curious to see if, if, uh, if Mike, if you see it the same way and not to take the question asking out of your hand, Steve, but that is the, that's the piece that I'm interested in now is, oh, you know, maybe we should prioritize intensity and then structure volume and frequency around trying to preserve that, which it's, it's, it's a conceptual thing. I don't have any structure around that yet, but that's, that's, I think where the next question for me lies. Go on, Mike. I know you, uh, you had a point there and Eric's yeah. got a great question for you as well. Yes. Yes. I, I wanted to dovetail off what Eric said. And it turns out that his supposition seems to be relatively directly addressed in the manuscript. So I'm going to read right out of the manuscript. The following moderators exhibited slopes that were lesser in magnitude compared uh, to the main effect and contained a null point estimate with confidence interval. And what that means is, I'll read the end, is these slopes of these variables I'm about to list suggest a shift from a meaningful to a negligible relationship in which there was less of an advantage of training close to failure compared to the main effect. There were no moderators that resulted in positive slopes that did not contain a null point estimate within the confidence interval. So these are variables that if they are more present in the study population, in the experimental design of the individual studies, that make the relationship between going closer to failure and more growth so weak that we can no longer statistically be really confident that it, it, it really exists. And here they are. Some of them are uh, just statistical uh, aberrations that will make no sense because it's just any time you take a whole that shows a relationship and you constrain the sample uh, to have just a part, it could not show a relationship even though one still exists. So some of these are nonsensical, but uh, a few of them really do jump out, and that could still mean that they're statistical aberrations, these few things, but I think there might be some more thought required about maybe they're not statistical aberrations because they do fold into the grand theory. So, so here they are. It is, um, so the, by the way, heads up for the folks listening, this is stuff that if you look into the actual data and you make these things more prominent, the failure equals more growth relationship starts to seem to break down. So here they are. It is studies that were set volume equated, I'm curious on that relationship, repetition volume equated, higher biological age. Okay, so if you're older, maybe training to failure no longer conveys the same advantages. Trained with multi-joint exercises, trained with single joint exercises, how could it be both? Again, this is collaboration very likely. Did not utilize progressive overload. Okay, so again, the way to a way to interpret that is if you do have a plan that utilizes progressive overload, we are no longer as confident that failure uh, equals as much growth as we have previously thought compared to non-failure included a failure definition, I would file that mostly under statistical stuff, uh, alternative set structures, higher frequency per muscle group, longer intervention duration, very curious on the cumulative fatigue effect there, higher percentages of male participants, which I'll personally say 
guys just try harder than girls on day one and day 50. There's some girls that can go crazy hard at the end of an intervention, but mostly it's reserved for high level athletes. So study after study, guys like you, men are dumb and you, you, you say, hey, ego, idiot, do this. They're just going to die in that machine. And girls are more reasonable is another way to see that. So as the percent of male participants goes up, failure seems to confer fewer advantages. That's curious because I think these are precisely the people who want to get what they get out of the study. Um, within participant designs, very curious because these technically are the most um, statistically hardcore designs that can really have a high internal validity. Again, that's probably not the failure thing. I think it would survive that just with a higher study sample size. A higher number of adjusted sets per week. That's a big deal, right? So the, what I get out of this is that the confidence with which you can say, look, failure training is better than not failure training degrades if you train with higher volumes, higher frequencies, higher durations of accumulations in a mesocycle, and just straight up try harder to begin with. In conjunction with Eric's excellent point, which is that, look, these aren't real world. So they, nobody, who the fuck trains legs only twice a week for eight weeks straight? Who does that? I don't know. Like, certainly people do that. But like, when you got guys talking about how training to failure is like the new thing because of this meta regression, these are the guys that go to the gym five, six days a week and train their whole bodies. And this study per se itself shows that people who do much more for longer with more sets and are more likely trying hard for them specifically, the relationship of go closer to failure to get more growth is broken down. We cannot conclude it. We should not conclude that it exists. So when you have the situation, now now we have kind of a, a picture emerging. I think this uh, meta regression does a wonderful thing, which is one of the first, maybe the first pieces of documentation that is real good evidence of the fact that per any given unit of effort, volume, whatever it is, Look, you got gun to your head. You got to grow as much muscle by tomorrow as possible. You had better take everything to failure and beyond, as a matter of fact. But as soon as you start training for longer with more volume and you try really hard and uh, you are training other muscle groups and systemic fatigue is a concern, then you have to come back and ask the same question of, okay, I know per unit failure still is the best because it is. But what else am I paying there and how do I pay that off? Because it's like, you know, if you want the best car in the world, whatever, Bugatti Veyron, it is, there it is. It's the fucking best, right? Whatever. I, car buffs are going to kill me for this shit. Um, Bugatti Veyron, Eric has one. He has actually three. One of them he just like threw in a dump because he didn't like the color. It's a strange story. So um, uh, if you, you want the best car ever, it's the Bugatti. But, but what if you only have $2 million and you don't want to spend 1.9 of it on a car? What's now the best car? Uh, probably not the Bugatti. You could get a C8 Corvette. It looks fucking dope. It only costs $65,000. Know, while it's not the best, in the context of you only having so much money, it now is much better than just spending all of your money on a car because you'd have to be nuts to do that. So coming back to the training thing, it's like it, one set or even as the study showed, well, you know, a few sets, five to 10 sets, 10 to 20 sets on one muscle group in a training uh, population with specific characteristics, not hardcore lifters, generally not people have been training for long time, not multi-muscle, multi, you know, six days a week kind of programs in that. And of course, zooming down almost certainly to one set, going to failure absolutely produces better results. But as long as fatigue is a consideration, in my view, this is tying in the theoretical, this is a supposition on my part, the stimulus to fatigue ratio of failure training is not as high as what I would think one or two RIR is. That's the highest. Uh, and then three, four, it's too easy and the stimulus isn't high enough, though the fatigue's not a ton, the stimulus starts to be unimpressive. So because that stimulus to fatigue ratio is something you really have to be paying attention to, if fatigue is a limiting factor in your training, you got to wonder about, it was a good idea for me to go to failure all the time. And I'm not even here to say no. I'm just here to say you might have to make some other adjustments in your program, like reducing the volume. And then you have to go back to Eric's question of like, well, like how much, like if I do one set of leg extensions and I like think of dark things and my eyes go bloodshot red and I systemically fatigue myself for the rest of the leg workout, is that really going to beat five sets of hack squats that are true to RIR? Like, 
I fucking doubt it. But as far as emotional draining, it'll be even more draining because there was a gun to my head, literally. So now I have to be like, how much adjustment can I make? So if you understand that failure training is the most effective, but also the most fatiguing, if fatigue is not a limiting factor, then, hey, failure training is great. And in fact, sometimes just way better. So for example, if someone's like, all right, I train two days a week. I do four total exercises, two sets. What do I do? I'm like, bro, every set better be life or death if you want maximum results. And they're going to be like, what about accumulated fatigue? I'm like, motherfucker, what you accumulate? Nothing. You're in the gym twice a fucking week for 30 minutes at a time. Get out of here. Your fatigue goes down later that night. You're good. Now, if someone's like, yeah, like I train two days, I train six days a week. I should be grinding everything to failure. I'm like, hold on. And then my next thing is, yes, this matter of aggression is fucking amazing. This is how science works. But also like, you ever try that shit? Like, I don't know, maybe people don't know this about me, but like for the first like eight years of my training career, I did every set, multiple sets to failure every single, I had a lot of issues from childhood. These real failure sets, not like the bullshit I'm doing now calling failure. This is the real, real. And my training took a quantum leap in results and a quantum leap down in injury when I stopped doing that shit. And if one does not simply train to failure multiple sets for real on real exercises, like you can do some fucking bent rows to failure. Now go do pull-ups to failure. Now go do pull-downs to failure. Now do lap prayers to failure. See you in three days for that same back workout repeated with progression. Like, wait, 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 hold on a second. I usually take a week. Oh, but uh, your fractional synthetic rate's ready in three days. Why aren't you back? Like, well, uh, uh, and then the whole thing breaks apart. Oh, but just kidding. I'm not going to see you in four days. I'm actually going to see you tomorrow because you got legs tomorrow. They're like, yeah, but I just trashed myself with this back workout. Tough shit. Oh, by the way, we're going to fail on everything legs tomorrow. And all of a sudden trying that in real life, you go back and read the meta regression. You're like, eh, somebody lied to me. Nobody lied to you. You just didn't actually read the manuscript and you read maybe the title. I just read the first word. I'm good enough. And rant. Sorry for ranting as usual, fellas. No, I think you actually said something really important in terms of the limitations of that study where same with Eric brought it up in terms of like most people are training way more than what is most of the studies that have looked at in this and so when you frame it like that i think it initially to some i guess evidence-based practitioners they might look at it and be like, oh this is surprising like failure is that much more hypertrophic but then that you tell them hey these are lower volumes lower frequencies of like, oh that kind of aligns with how i saw things before right. mike i know it, you have a point yeah sorry it's, it's even in and Th that part is not a supposition. It's directly addressed in the manuscript, saying that when we look at when more training was done, that is no longer the case. So the way to, if you read the reverse of that, you optimize for failure. When is failure a good idea? That manuscript has it in there. Zach, you could have written it differently and been like, here, if you want to maximally benefit from failure, here's the good candidacy situations. You're female you train not so frequently you're not going to train for a long time before taking a break uh et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. the per session volume's not high your weekly volume's not high you don't also like eric said train many other muscle groups with a bunch of other sessions per week then that's when you can best use failure training and all i want to say is that's data driven that's not supposition so when we think about it that way it's like oh Oh, wow. Okay, cool. And then if you look at your bodybuilding lens and go, okay, when is it time for me to train a failure? You look at your program, you're like, it's actually backwards from all that stuff that seems to be a good idea with failure training. At least I have to give this some thought. And maybe the result is, okay, I do train to failure, but I adjust some other variables. Or the result is I, I do go failure every now and again, but I don't train to failure all the time. It, it's just not as simple. And as a matter of fact, would be wrong to be like, yeah, man, you fucking got to go to failure, bro. Like, I hear you, but you can't read good just kidding i had to be snarky i'm gonna get a toss here yeah I, i'll chime in here a little bit first and foremost mike i think you did a great job kind of describing that 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 moderator section is uh one that i will definitely try to make a little bit more friendly to read in the uh the published version but you did an awesome job kind of going through I thought that it was plenty friendly to read man you did great <laughs> it just says it right there <laughs> Um, yeah, so I, I guess I'll, I'll hit on a few things there that I think are really, really important. The first thing, just to get my my layer of caution out there, like you said, Mike, you hit on a few things. The number of observations that are going to kind of contribute to each one of those moderator analyses can be substantially slashed, depending on which one we're talking about there. And then in addition to that, the the additional parameters that go, would go into a model that investigates each one of those moderator analyses substantially rises as well. So the uncertainty intervals with every single one of those moderator analyses is extremely wide. So there's a lot of just 
we're just kind of feeling things out and getting nudges in either direction on where things may lie there, but we're already dealing with a low number of studies, low number of observations, low sample size, et cetera. So what, just as we shouldn't overinterpret the overall relationship, I think it'd be good to just make sure we don't do that with the, the uh, sub analysis as well. I'm not saying you're doing that. I think every single one of the things you just said is absolutely incredible, but just making sure we layer that with caution as well. So now that that's out of the way and we can talk about the fun stuff again, um, I think there's two big things that come from this overall discussion that I think are important to kind of all of us put our coaching hats on and kind of talk through because there's not going to be an answer from the literature. The first one is, as we've already kind of discussed, everything we just said in terms of you know, training with higher volumes, training with higher frequencies, all the factors that are mentioned in comparison to the literature comparison to what we would actually prescribe for somebody training for hypertrophy, there's going to be a substantial difference there. The, the issue is just because there is a difference there, that that space isn't explored. So we don't really know, or we can't make an affirmative claim based on evidence, at least what is better in that case. And that's where I think we have some work to do in terms of the next few projects in terms of We've done a good job equating a lot of variables, but I think it's time to start looking at more of these ecologically valid approaches that may not be as scientifically rigorous in some aspects where we're controlling every single variable except proximity to failure, because that's not the approaches people are comparing in the real world. You know, a lower volume approach where every set is taken to or even past failure with some of the longer muscle length stuff that's coming out versus something that's a little bit higher volume and a little bit more submaximal RAR, where they're training all major muscle groups four days a week, you know, as long as the intervention as we can get that's the type of study that we're looking for to actually answer the question that we're interested in for the population we want to apply this to so that's the first thing that's what we need to actually know what to do and with the question we're interested in now given that what we have the question to me that's interesting from a practical perspective is we all have these cases that we can point to where we think fatigue becomes an issue but detecting that on the individual level from a practical perspective, I think is that's the, that's the good stuff. That's the key where somebody can actually listen to this podcast and say, that's what I'm looking for when I go and train on my session on Monday, because it's easy to talk in the clouds and say, in theory, higher volumes, higher frequencies, multi-joint exercises, shorter rest, or whatever it is, is potentially going to impact my performance. But what changes potentially to it is that's the, that's the, the, the key to me. And so the, the kind of, I guess a few things that I kind of went through to try to ask myself, okay, fresh slate, what is some sort of objective rationale that I can look for to determine when the fatigue is excessive? And so I kind of started going through what, at least from the evidence perspective, what are, what are some lines of research that suggest fatigue is the issue in the first place? And I was actually finding a lot of things that would suggest it's not on, on, on the other side of the thing. So just a few things to go to. Eric, you already pointed out the very first one, the longitudinal proximity to failure studies themselves to some degree, although there's the massive limitation of all the things we just said, they theoretically should show some issues if, if fatigue is a thing and it doesn't really seem to be the case. Put that on top of the fact that we essentially have zero longitudinal training studies. There's one that is still limited that shows we maybe to some degree adapt to proximity to failure over time, but we're really missing the actual fatigue measurements there. And if those did exist, the longitudinal evidence should pick that up. The next thing that I think the, the biggest kind of fatigue proxy I think people utilize for hypertrophy is going to be some sort of repetition volume or volume load. There's absolutely limitations to volume load that I'm going to mention. You know, if you, Base example, if you have group A and group B and one group is 50% stronger at baseline, the volume load could already be biased independent of the study design. But nonetheless, usually I would say it's still fair to compare in some of these designs. If losses in volume load were a massive deal for hypertrophy, another area that I think it would be picked up in is kind of high versus low loads and their relationship to proximity to failure. We know that in an isolated set, training with 30% of 1RM versus 80% of 1RM to failure, you're reduction in performance from the low loads is probably going to be way more than the high loads. Yet, both of them seem to exhibit the same relationship to proximity to failure and even more potentially with low loads, which would be the opposite if that fatigue actually was an issue, theoretically. Obviously, there's other factors there, but that's just another area you would potentially see it be picked up. The, the next one would be 
the intensity technique data. Now I've, I've written some stuff on this, that there's definitely some fuzzy stuff that goes along with this, just as an easy example in the drop set research, very often it's not set equated. So that gets it a little bit messy, but nonetheless, for the most part, a lot of the intensity technique stuff, which artificially harms your performance through a variety of different ways, seems to lead to the same longitudinal outcomes. And that kind of seems to play against some of the fatiguing mechanisms once again. Um, the other thing would be, this one's a little bit more contrived, but exercise order stuff. So anything that is going to artificially harm your performance on the most direct exercises that might also suggest that that would be a little bit worse if fatigue was a thing, but it really doesn't seem to from the best evidence that we have. So kind of going through all those things, I would expect every one of those to kind of play in, in, in relationship to our anecdote here, but doesn't seem to the, the biggest one that I think you could make a solid argument for is some of the rest interval data. Now, I think there are some other things with that, though, that we often don't consider. So there's a few studies that have good direct measures of hypertrophy and look at, you know, good um, solid training programs where they're doing a ton of volume and, and stuff like that. You know, compare three minutes rest versus one minute rest. And that's going to be a classic example where your performance is harmed a ton um, for, for like hypertrophy oriented training. And on average, it seems to shorter rest intervals seem to be worse for hypertrophy. So that seems to be support for fatigue being detrimental for hypertrophy. But the, the, the few things I'd think about with this, when I kind of revisited this with a fresh mindset um, and trying to be a little bit more agnostic of this is first and foremost, this seems to be a weird area where introductory kind of training doesn't really seem to be considered. So, you know, if somebody that maybe habitually trains with three minute rest intervals, buddy, you're doing 60 second rest intervals on squat the second you get into the gym on, on that first session. And actually there's two studies by Sousa Jr. at all that kind of show if you progressively decrease your rest interval, hypertrophy may not be harmed any longer. And so that's another interesting thing there where the rest interval data may not be as straightforward as people think. Um, and then another thing that I think about for particularly for hypertrophy is if volume load seems to be the thing that we care about here, why can't we just reduce the load for the next set? The thing that's going to dominate the volume load calculation is the number of repetitions that you're going to perform in a given load. And if there's a really wide range of loads that we can use that are productive for hypertrophy, we could probably rescue a lot of that um, with, with performing, you know, a little bit higher repetitions on the next set and not just allowing fatigue to decay our repetition pattern, if that makes sense. So all this said, I think when I look at the few studies from the rest interval data, that do seem to suggest that lo longer rest intervals seem to be beneficial for hypertrophy. It seems to be around a 30% difference in volume load actually seems to result in differences in longitudinal outcomes. So coming back to the actual conversation of interest here, when we look at the, probably the best acute study that we have on this is, is from Martin. Um, the difference in the total number of repetitions performed for success to failure on the bench press, which again is limited, not a whole pr program, et cetera, was about 8%. So to me, that alone makes me somewhat question the mechanistic rationale of fatigue being a deterrent from training failure, training to failure. However, what I think was probably going to color all these anecdotes that you guys just mentioned and kind of bring us home is I think there's just purely just logistical reasons that we're not able to actually reach task failure when we have all these factors that we're talking about. And I think it just comes from a greater perception of discomfort that we're ultimately going to reach when you're training with lower loads, you're training with higher set volumes, you're consistently doing that session after session and doing it for week after week after week, all of those things might just inflate our ability to not even reach that point of task failure where your mind starts to play tricks on you a little bit. And that experience of an isolated set no longer is the same task that you're actually testing. And so that's kind of something that I've tried to revisit with a, with a fresh pair of eyes and ask myself, what is it about fatigue that my anecdote is the exact same as your guys as you know, it, it matches up perfectly. And as, as you said, Mike, there's some indication in our analysis that all these relationships exist. But to me, the most important question is, why does that seem to be the case? And then that's going to influence the way that we troubleshoot it with our programming. And so I don't know what you guys kind of think about that kind of ramble on fatigue and, and its implications. But um, that, that, that was kind of what I want to get your thoughts on. I think really, really interesting. Uh, it kind of brings me back to something Eric said there where he's previously preserving kind of volume and not letting other things detract from that. It's like, well, like maybe 
the fatigue side we don't want to detract from the intensity side here and so that would like reduce the amount of volume that we even need to maybe perform and things like this so yeah i don't know if eric you had any further thoughts on anything zach was saying there i do um first i'm just really appreciative of zach because he's obviously he's been playing with this data in his mind and thinking about the relationships and their implications for over a year now um so one thing um i made a threads comment about this by the way follow me on threads um that there's there's the, the timing of this meta analysis is interesting culturally because for whatever reason right now on tiktok mike menser has had a resurgence um and Boo. you know the, <laughs> <laughs> i'm gonna yeah, get a lot I, of shit for that i mean like yeah i mean he's got an awesome physique he's a cool guy he was also addicted to methamphetamines and and kind of took things really far and and lost his ability to be rational at a certain point like i'm not trying to denigrate him and say don't listen to him but it's it's a surprising resurgence out of all the possible old school bodybuilders as a history buff but i also get it we're in a visual age and when you watch someone go to absolute failure who's jacked and you get these old videos and it's um it's marketable and i do think that pushing yourself to the, the, your nth degree, the only way that really gets to be visually demonstrated in bodybuilding is this. Even though the actual act of that and everyone on this call who's competed knows is dieting down to stage condition. But that's kind of like this marathon thing that's hard to show. You just visually see the outcome. So anyway, the timing of this meta regression is interesting because there's a resurgence of interest. And that is oddly enough leading to some kind of like revisionist thinking with the data we have on volume to get kind of to your your question steve and it's people going like yeah i knew it science now shows you just need you know a couple sets to failure per muscle group and what they're forgetting is that actually our data on volume has the interaction with failure already every single study in the 2017 meta-analysis by schoenfeld had the subjects uh training to failure and the the pushback i got when i pointed that out on threads was yeah but were they really training to failure and i'm like to the same degree that they were in the meta regression that zach did it's the same research some of the same studies are included and eric the point sorry being, and to a higher degree than you train in the gym you fucking pussy criticizing that shit you ever have three fucking researchers and one of them is a fucking hot ass undergrad bitch with a clipboard yell at you to do more leg extensions you will move fucking earth and heaven itself before you quit on that shit yo i've been if anyone who's been involved in training studies knows man those those goddamn poor kids leave their lives on that shit you don't train like that week after week i know you because i see you in the gym motherfucker in the same school sorry i'm sure some people train that hard it's, it's, it's a very different thing to say well they don't really train hard really you've been involved in a research study and made people train hard like no shut up sorry eric i'm sorry i i, I feel like i'm in a rap battle and my hype man just like took the mic from me and it's just like <laughs> no, hold up hold up hold up Mary. let me get this, this really quick MC, you know? <laughs> I'm, I'm the guy that took like the gat out and you're like whoa, 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 whoa it's just a rap show we're not this here to shoot people this is come on calm down um so yes, people do train hard in training studies, just to, to reiterate what Mike said uh, in, in more concise, more PG terminology as I often do. But uh, yes, so the, the meta-analysis we have that have this linear, albeit diminishing dose response, that's not linear. It's a dose response relationship that diminishes with volume and hypertrophy. The sub, these, are, these are studies people train into failure. So you can say training to failure is superior to not train into failure. And even without a bunch of nuance, you're kind of technically correct. But you can't then say, and that's why I only do five sets and, re re and remain in that kind of broad sweeping stroke that's still generally evidence-based because we have the relationship with volume to failure and it's still that 10 plus uh, range or that 12 to 20 range if you want to use Baz Val's more recent meta-analysis in 2022. So. I think a really interesting thing is that you don't get to just have the research vindicate the parts of the philosophies you already held that you like, but not the rest. So I'm okay with someone who was, let's say they were, you know, a mentor adherent and they were like, yeah, I, I just do, you know, one to two sets per week per muscle group to absolute failure. And uh, that's based upon 
uh, this this meta regression. And then I go, hey, you know, have you seen these these volume meta analyses? They also trained to failure, and they did better when they did ten plus. And they go, oh wow, okay, so failure is still important, but I can do more than that. Cool. Now I'm going to do I'm going to I'm going to try going up and see if you know I'm close to the mean or if I'm a standard deviation lower or higher based upon my individual predilection. That that ends totally fine in my mind, but I think it's just really important to acknowledge that the failure data still has a volume relationship right now. We understand that more volumes of going to failure to a point seem to outperform on average, not everyone, uh, than lower volumes of going to failure. And I think that as I say that, I also have to address that previously, probably the error we made, which was a little premature, and I think this meta meta regression is making me rethink some of the things I've said in the past, was that Previously, I was happy to be like, oh, look at this. We've got a couple meta analyses showing the dose response with failure. So volume is really important. So maybe we should pull back on failure a little bit to get more volume. And that's the same mistake, just inverse of saying, hey, failure is really important. So forget about volume. So I think this is just a really useful meta regression because it helps us understand that both are important, that both play a role in increasing the stimulus. And it highlights the issue we have as slightly more evolved monkeys, where anytime there's a multivariate relationship, we go, but how about I just make it univariate when I talk? Like, all right, so volume's important, cool, so nothing else is. Oh, wait, so now failure's important, so everything changed, and it's actually the same data. You know, it's just us taking the existing body of research and analyzing it. And I think the take home here is that when Mike, I think, talked about this quite in depth, you don't get the pull all the levers at the same time and have an additive effect. They have a non-additive effect. In fact, one takes away from the other. So really the question is, it's an optimization game now. We have to figure out what is the appropriate amount of volume at this intensity. And then, okay, am I someone, and these are some of the things that I think as a coach, if I try to conceptualize this, all right. So, you know, I think some of the arguments that Mike and I have had in the past about muscle damage probably stem from the fact that I can crush myself and I just don't get that sore. And, you know, so that flavors my, my experience. Um, so it, does that mean that someone like me or someone who can really crush themselves, even with a relatively new exercise, right? Um, and the amount of soreness they experience is a standard deviation or two lower than the average bodybuilder. Would they benefit from doing, you know, higher intensities at higher volumes versus someone else who they get disproportionate amounts of muscle damage from being closer to failure, maybe they would be better to two RIR in doing more volume. I, I don't know, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm very open to the possibility that on an individual basis, this relationship might not even be the same. Like, yes, there's a relationship between volume and intensity and one drives the other one down to how much they can be useful, but that may be a slightly different relationship for Steve versus Zach versus Mike versus Eric. And that doesn't make it any easier on our job as coaches. In fact, it makes it more complex, but it's a good thing to know just that you could actually have some people who would do better with reducing volume and training close into failure. And you might have some people who do better on the opposite. And it's not just going, all right, everyone should train closer to failure based upon this meta regression. Now we seem to find the right volume dose for you, but it actually might be a different relationship between those two things. So I think that, um, I don't know if that's true, but I think that's highly possible and i think that is uh just makes our jobs a little harder yeah yeah I, i'm plugged two things real quick the first one is i've noticed the uh the comment about how the meta regression justifies training with lower volumes a lot and i i i don't i don't understand it this is one of the things i want to fix in the in the published version as well as providing a visualization of all of those moderator analyses and when you plot the the volume analysis what that is saying is that the slope is marginally changing as the volumes increase. That doesn't say that the line for the higher volumes isn't higher than the lower volume because it definitely was. That that it as you, as actually what you're saying, Eric. That's picked up in our analysis as well. The the thing we were interested in our analysis was the slope between RIR, but the absolute outcomes for higher volumes were still higher. So that that's absolutely critical to, to mention. And and in no in no way does the analysis justify training with you know you know much lower volumes than I guess what other work would say. It's right in line with it, if anything. Um, yeah, but then I don't think they know what the word slope means, the people who are saying <laughs> that. So that, that might be part of the problem. 
but now I'm yeah. being snarky. I'll, I'll stop. <laughs> uh, but but the second thing I was going to say is I might not have done a, a good job kind of wrapping it up and pointing it out, but the the individual nature of things and deciding what is that threshold when the intuition becomes reality. That's the thing that I think is it's tough to tease out right now, but that's what we're looking for. And I think the 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 rough approximation just from everything that uh, I kind of went through was, you know, the the rest interval data, which I think is kind of the the closest kind of fatigue proxy we can get. The, the studies that seem to show a negative inca- impact on that and the longitudinal outcomes is somewhere around that, like that 30% reduction. Now, again, that's not something to use with a calculator and do really finely, but I think that's a, that's like a decent way to kind of ask yourself, you know, you're performing a given bout of training, you're maybe no longer progressing how you'd like to, and maybe you perform a very similar kind of overall dosage of training, but the RAR is is different. And if that meaningfully influences your performance to the extent that you can get way more performance out of that session with a similar amount of volume over that kind of 30% threshold or so, that might be something that could really push the needle for you on the individual level. Whereas for somebody who can, like Eric just mentioned, he, he may not get very sore from doing a ton of sets of a rows, let's say, to failure. Um, and he performs that kind of session, doesn't really seem to get a ton of a difference in, in the volume load that he's performing. He's probably better maximizing the stimulus of each set in that case. So I think that's ultimately, from a practical perspective, to me, that's what we're looking for is, and we can't answer that with the current data, obviously, but that to me is the interesting thing is we all have these isolated anecdotes of to say, this can be a problem. But how do we know when it is a problem for for somebody who's asking, you know, in, in the the comments of this YouTube video, um, you know, you know that that identifying that point, I think, is the thing that's tough to do, but that is the thing that is ultimately the most useful um, to provide. So I think to have a really good answer, we fundamentally just need to compare the different approaches that are more kind of like these archetypes rather than directly manipulating one variable. But I guess from from that kind of framing, I don't know if there's any kind of rough lines of, of thinking that, that you guys kind of have to try to identify in that point where it becomes too much of a, a performance decrement or too much fatigue um, to actually give somebody something to, to tangibly work with on a day-to-day um, basis in the gym. Do you not see the progress you would like? Are you sick of writing your own programs? Or perhaps you need some accountability in order to stick with the plan? Then it's time to start working with us. We at Revive Stronger offer a truly personalized coaching service. You'll get more than just an email with some macros or random cookie cutter program. With Revive Stronger, you will be the center of our attention. You will receive your own fully individualized training protocol alongside a customized nutritional strategy. We created the coaching around your needs, wants, personal preferences, and your own unique lifestyle. Every single week, we delve into your program in order to make appropriate adjustments so that we get the most out of your time and the best possible outcome. We help both female and male athletes to seriously change their body composition by adding more muscle mass and decreasing fat tissue. No matter if you're a competitive bodybuilder or just want to look better, if you need help with your progress and taking your physique to the next level, our coaching is for you. It's time to make a change. Sign up today and let's revive stronger. Go for Mike. Yeah, great thoughts. Um... On the, I'd like to touch on the fatigue thing. Um, and to me, there's a pretty big difference between acute fatigue and cumulative fatigue. Um, the rest interval stuff addresses acute fatigue, but cumulative fatigue is a bit of a different animal. It accumulates over weeks. It has pretty intense systemic effects. It can cause you to have, to be essentially in sympathetic overdrive where your sleep suffers your mood suffers, you begin to experience overreaching and overtraining symptoms. You actually feel more victimized than any particular scenario. That's a curiosity. You feel like defensive and kind of like a rat in the back of a cage with electricity. And so the study of that properly, like the study of what happens to race cars at 200 miles an hour, you got to go 200 miles an hour for that shit. Like you say, okay, what is the effect of taking my Toyota from 50 miles an hour to 80 miles an hour? Like, is it not much. I'm like, okay, well, so it turns out there is no added risk at higher speed. It's like, well, try to get it going 140 and you'll fly off the freeway and die. You're like, okay. So it would be, Zach, to your point, very difficult to study cumulative fatigue because you'd have to get people that push themselves hard enough to earn it. And that 
either you have really jacked, really strong, really mentally focused people, or you have months and months and months of continual bashing. There's an extra problem with that of retaining subjects. Uh, you know, subject attrition is a real thing. And after you feel truly burdened by systemic fatigue, man, fuck that. I'm not going back to that stupid research lab. Tell them I died or I'm sick or I broke my leg. Then you'll get a lot of that. Uh, you could do some cool statistical analyses of like, what is the volume at which people attrit? You know, <laughs> it's just like after a certain amount, they're like, fuck that. So it, it is a very, very difficult thing to study. But kind of weaving that in to what metrics can we use Probably one of my best metrics that I use and uh, uh, the RPI hypertrophy app is sort of built in with is uh, your best repetition performance. So your strength for reps. Now, if you can continue to set many PRs in the gym week after week after week, get a little stronger in the leg press every time, we can say that you're excessively fatigued, but the definition of recovery in sports science is ability to get back to baseline and not underperform compared to usual. So if you're as strong or stronger in the leg press than you ever were, you're not actually accumulating enough fatigue for it to really fundamentally disturb the results of your program because you're getting them. Look at you. You're doing the thing. So you actually have to take people far enough to get those. Here, here we go. It was only a matter of time. You get them to their MRV and beyond maximum recovery volume, and then they cannot hang in there. And then they start to degrade in their performance. And that's when, you know, accumulated fatigue has become too high. The next question I'd have to ask is, okay, we have two groups. They do everything the same. One goes to all out failure and one doesn't average of, let's say two RIR, which one is going to get to their MRV first. I'd bet a whole lot of money. It's the failure group. And then you have to do another analysis after that. Say, okay, if we have a group that can train to failure, and they last four weeks without needing a deload week. And another group that doesn't train to failure that can last six weeks without needing a deload week. On the net balance, did they grow differently from one another? And you could look at the analysis. So let's say it said they actually grew the same per week, per week. Then we could say, okay, it looks like failure training sucks because it robs you of two high quality weeks. Every six week cycle, you could have been training great for two weeks, but you're deloading instead. Not a big difference, but it could be a difference. Or you could say, actually, it's the same growth between them. Uh, four, uh, four weeks total versus six weeks total. One goes to failure, one doesn't. Same growth. You're like, oh, fuck, I can squeeze my growth into a smaller amount of time. But then the next question becomes is how sustainable is that over multiple mesocycles? Because you can, you guys, I'm sure have had this experience. You put a, together a great program, great meso, it goes amazing. You do it again, you fall apart in a fucking 50 million pieces. You're like, ah, oh, I actually can't do 20 sets of tricep extensions without my elbows hurting. I did it for a month, but then after that didn't work. So sustainability becomes the core feature. Again, very difficult to go with training study design, but one shortcut I have is this mythical thing called training quality, which much of which I actually sharpened my thinking of reading Eric Helms stuff. And training quality to me, I'll stop. So uh, training quality to me is first of all, are you hitting your performance parameters in the gym? Like you like press four or five last time for 10. Is it 11 this time? Or is it 410 pounds? Something, right? Something's going up. The, you can't really like, not hit a PR and actually do a little less. And someone's like, did you have a good workout? You're like, yeah, it was crazy. Like, no, it wasn't motherfucker. You lying to me. You suck today. So are you getting better? The next one is more of a perceptive one. Is it how was your perception of your movement, your range of motion? How did your muscles feel? You were crazy sore. Did your joints hurt? Or was it one of those just high quality ball sessions where everything feels like ice cream and then you have fuck mega pump? If you train to failure consistently and you can string together a huge number of weeks of high quality training, you'll be getting stronger and the shit feels good. Your joints feel great. Your brain feels great. Every session you come in ready to a fucking war, then, hey, listen, I will shake your hand and be like, this clearly is working for you versus how many sessions in a row can you string together that are high quality in which you go just shy of failure. In my experience, there is a totally inverse relationship between the two, but I have not found it to be linear. I have found it that in a high volume program as a male, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all those caveats. If I go to failure all the time, I get like two and a half good weeks of training. And then I need a week and a half of fucking total rest basically to cobble myself together. If I go to our on average, I get four weeks of great training. The last week I'll go to failure. Fuck it. Why not deload next week? And then I take one week of deload, I feel amazing, and then I can repeat that process. There is a sustainability question with training to failure or not. And 
training to failure can be made totally sustainable by just rigging the volume low enough. However, as Eric's citation of the meta-analysis showed, you rig the volume low enough, you're actually just giving away gains. So what you don't want to do is attach yourself to this idea of I'm going to train to failure, I'm going to work the rest of my program around that. There is a way in which that'll make much better sense than just train a failure, not working your program around it. Absolutely make the adjustments. Yes, lower the volume. But how much do you have to lower the volume by? And is it worth that volume lowering on the net balance for hypertrophy? And so to me, the answer is for most people really who are gung ho about lifting, who do it a lot, who do it super hard, saying I have to go to failure every time robs you of continual high quality training, which will generally reflect itself in your injury or physique years down the line. Whereas if you say, look, every now and again, failure is great because it tests me and it makes sure my RIR calculations aren't wildly off base. But on average, my training is like two RIR then it's fucking incredible because it just allows me high quality training. I still challenge myself with failure quite regularly, but I just put together much better strings of mesocycles. I get hurt less. My joints hurt less. Psychic energy is still around. Like it's hard to really, really just really go to failure, especially on difficult lifts like leg press and stuff. Like how many people really go to failure? Like, first of all, no, you fucking don't because you don't have spotters dragging you out of the leg press. So none, nobody really goes to failing leg press because that would just be a bad idea. Right. And then so you factor all this in, you really try train to failure and all the stuff. It gets really fatiguing in a non-linear, in my experience, exponential way. Could I be wrong about that? Yes. Do some people just handle failure better? Yes, definitely. And they could benefit from going close to failure, but not at the total expense of the rest of the equation. And so to me, training stimulus is like filling a cup. Like you can fill it with more volume, which is like a more diluted juice, but there's a lot of juice. You can feel it, fill it with concentrate, which is failure training. Like that's a shitload of stuff, but they still don't have that much of it. And let's say it costs a ton. So your fatigue is really high from it. You still got to fill the cup one way or another. In my experience and from learning a whole bunch of sports science, uh, not, this is not the fallacy of the middle ground here, I'm close. Um, a moderated, occasionally intense approach seems to work best. How do we know that? First of all, I don't know of any sport which consistently trains maximum performance only. I just don't know of any sport like that. You tell a soccer coach, like, it's 100% like small sided games all day. He'd be like, I'm fucking crazy. You want me to have you broken soccer players next week? And you're like, well, these guys are fucking pussies. They got to go hard. You're like, clearly you've never played soccer before. Sure. Just you're drunk. Just walk off the field. Right. That's the result you would get there. I just don't weightlifting powerlifting powerlifters don't go to failure hardly at all, which as a matter of fact, your uh, matter of aggression found that like good, good job fellas. Cause it fucking doesn't work all that well, but it would be very curious to me if bodybuilding was the sole exception in which grinding to failure all the time, was the superlative overall holistic approach. To me, it seems more like don't you just start with moderate versions of all the variables and then go from there and try to titrate one up while keeping the other stable. See how that affects your training quality. So try to titrate one up and bring the other one back down to moderate and go from there. Here's a really quick example. Don't do two sets of exercises. Don't do six sets. Just start with four. And then don't do all out failure. Don't go five RIR. Start with two to three RIR and just go train like that for a while. And then keep the exercise set number, tighten up that RIR, go real far and go to failure and beyond failure. See how that affects your results. Then you can play with volume and then you can play with them both later to find where you can do the thing that we want to do, which is have amazing sessions that really fuck you up that you can heal for the next session on time and have high quality performance time and time and time again because muscle is not built in one session it's built over the whole year of sessions if you can put together the highest quality training that is both very challenging for you and sustainable you have a no lose proposition can you optimize that yes but that's no longer asking the question of is it failure or is it not it's asking what is your average rir it, should we be three should it be one should it be two the answer may be different like you guys said based on different people but it, we're, we're trying to search for extremes we already know that some failure can replace some volume and vice versa what we're really looking for as eric said as an optimization equation so why not start in the middle with just some decent approaches and then try to play with the variables yourself and figure out how they work uh, and, and that's the thing. Another thing really quick while I'm on the subject super fast, I promise, is to me, a lot of times a dogmatic approach results in practices that are clearly dogma because they're just, they're not rational in the moment. 
for example, if, if you have a practice like, yo, bro, I fight anyone that gets in my face. Like, what if someone just is on a subway car and they're like, oh, sorry, sir. It's just really like, I just have to get close to you to get in. Do you punch them? No, that's nonsense. People out in the street, maybe you punch their face off and maybe that's a fine practice. So people say, I always go to failure. Okay, what if you took, took an active rest phase and you know that just like two sets of eight at four RIR is going to jack your arms up and you're going to be sore for three days? You're still going to failure? Why not just take the easiest gains of your life and fucking run? Isn't there time later to get super nuts and super aggressive when you that's the only stimulus left over? So to, um, to me, a lot of times when people are like, hey, man, I'm fucking all out. Or back in the day, this by the way, this crazy shit has been repeated many times. Back at Eric is the best bodybuilding historian, I think, ever at this point. Um, Eric, you'll this will be fond memories from you. Back in the early 90s, you had the volume era where they just like it was like 40 sets for back, and you're like, I'm sorry, 40 work sets, like, yep, that's back, and we do it twice a week. And you're like, okay, and guys would be like, up day one, 40 sets, and it's like, you don't need 40 sets on day one, start with five, and if it's very compelling, go to eight next week. So, that whole idea of like it's failure or it's not, it's you start easy and make things harder. And making things harder may mean progressing closer to failure, adding load on the bar. And if those all are like, okay, the quality is solid, but I'm just recovering pretty fast, then you can constrain the frequency, make it higher frequency, or crank up the volume per session. But there's a situation in here in which we don't have to be comparing this versus this. They both work. We're just trying to find the optimum levels of them working. I've said enough. This makes me think of the question I asked you at the start, Eric, where I asked, why wouldn't you train to momentary muscular failure all the time? Because there's clearly from the meta regression, some really good things to get for hypertrophy there. And Mike basically just explained in a really good way, kind of if you pull too hard on one lever, you end up taking away from another and like you remove volume from the equation. So it just becomes a complete issue for you. And I'd be interested on your take, Zach, on the accumulated fatigue aspects. I know you were talking a lot about kind of maybe that acute fatigue, and that's where most of the studies have been. What do you think to kind of the the issue of cumulative fatigue? Yeah, I think I think the first thing to say is that it's, I'm I'm having a hard time disagreeing with either of these guys. I was trying to you know play a little bit of devil's <laughs> advocate with the whole fatigue thing, and it's 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 tough. Um, the intuition is too strong, and Mike is too good of a communicator to do so. Um, but uh, anyway. Um, yeah, I think, I think it's a, it's a, it's a valid point. I think accumulated fatigue is something that's really, really difficult to study. I know there's been a few kind of review papers that have, have talked about, you know, does accumulated fatigue exist? I don't particularly take a strong position on either of that. I think it's extremely challenging to measure as somebody who kind of comes from a strength background. I would pretty much take it to my grave that high loads are more fatiguing in something than low loads, despite every single thing in the literature suggesting otherwise i don't know what that is but man i was gonna die dude. on that hill alone now you're dying on that <laughs> hill with me dude i listen real quick i'm sorry i'm sorry i'm being a total dick all the fucking oh, <laughs> shit i get on the internet about this is well deserved i'm a cocksucker um just to, to support your point i watched a training partner of mine who was a champion powerlifter at squad at 800 a competition when we trained for hypertrophy he would train he would get tired the next day he'd feel great when he trained for strength a fraction of the sets but like you really have to fucking gear up for these like death squats like 765 for five like you don't just do that i watched him fall asleep during his work day just just pass out i watched him just mentally not be there for days after he lost something in those squats he didn't get back for a long time so there's something to really heavy fucking weight and the getting up for it it's it must be neurological or whatever it is it's a real thing and real quick to the cumulative fatigue thing i wish to fucking god it wasn't real it just hits you in the face and if it's not real amazing i'm just hallucinating it but like there's a reason people take trend because it makes that go away and then your bicep comes off the bone sorry okay i'm done i'm sorry zach Oh, you're, you're this totally is going to make me want to be now the asshole. So now, now that you created a segue preventing Zach from talking, I'm going to jump in and also <laughs> prevent him from talking. Um, I don't think we have the ability to measure or we have the logistical feasibility to measure what that experience is, but it's real. As someone who's been competing in powerlifting and bodybuilding for since the beginning, um, like, for example, there's a 2019 systematic review by Grandout on overtraining in, uh, 
in, in resistance training. And it's like, they never actually found a single incidence of overtraining. They found some non-functional overreaching, but they didn't find the whole like, yeah, for three months, like these endurance athletes, you performance couldn't be rescued no matter what we did. And it's just, you're just going to have to rest. You blew it up. Sorry. Check back with me next Olympic cycle. You know, um, it just doesn't seem to be a thing, but I think while the technical sports science definition of recovery is, is your performance back to baseline in my experience, other things fall off before that. And to Mike's earlier point, when you're in a research lab, you can be motivated to perform well, even when you probably shouldn't, even when it's probably net detriment. Um, there's even a term that's come up called mechanical overreaching. It's popped up in some places. And it's when essentially you're still able to get a performance. And that may not be the thing that's happening, but you're creating soft tissue injury, pain, stress, or your higher likelihood of, of, of getting hurt even though like, if you could perform, you would be able to. And I definitely think that's something that most powerlifters experience. Like, yeah, if I didn't have a little tweak in my shoulder right now, I could, I could, I could bench PR, you know, or if my hips would allow me, I did a new five set, uh, you know, like volume load PR right now. And I think the mental aspect, all those things, whatever, whatever it is, it's probably some combination of factors, but I think it's, it's challenging. I'm not sure it's the right question of whether your performance is back to baseline. It is a question of holistic sustainability, which is just that term, it, you know, is going to piss off a quantitative researcher. Like, what the hell does that mean? You know, like, that's at least 10 things I have to quantify. And then there's an interaction for it. Like, so I think it's very, very, very challenging to make clear statements that are not anecdotal or qualitative about fatigue. And I don't think our typical definitions of recovery necessarily get at that. But I will say that even though all that's true, I don't think it negates its reality, which we've all experienced firsthand. I think it was Broderick Chavez that said something like, you know, when you, deloading is like shitting, you know, when you need one. Uh, sorry, that just, that's all I could think of when we we're talking through this is like accumulative fatigue. It's something that I've, like, we've all experienced. You just kind of get to a point where you're like, I am fucked. <laughs> like, like, I need to do something here to ameliorate this. So at least that's. That's some more anecdote. <laughs> yeah, no, and for the record, I 100% agree. My intuition tells me it's it's real and every bone in my body would put money on it. So um, I'm, I'm with that 100%. I think, yeah, it's, it's ultimately the, 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 the point we're at now is just discussing what strategies and what signs would make us want to prioritize the tweaking of one variable versus the other. I think, I guess, I guess just purely qualitatively, the, the thing that I think is probably the two things that maybe the kind of the recent discussion on this topic, at least kind of pushes in the direction of, you know, training closer to failure or whatever, maybe two things is one is it maybe it's as not as clear as like two RER is the exact same as failure. I guess that's like, there's a potential benefit to be considered there. I think that may be something that we could glean from that. And then two is just the, to me, from all the discussion we've had here, there absolutely is a case in which training too close to failure and the fatigue associated with that is going to have negative effects. But I think not having a absolutely de facto position on that is probably also a good thing. So just understanding that, you know, I could go through a few things, you know, the exercise selection obviously matters. The, 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 uh, the definition of failure, you know, with all the range of motion talk, I think that's like something that needs to be further explored of like, um, you know, training to failure on a squat, maybe part of the reason that's so miserable. And we all associate with that in our minds is that's leg press squat, hack squat. Anytime someone's talking about fatigue and failure, I bet there's an over 90% chance. That's what they're thinking of. Um, that might be because, if we were able to stick an electrode in their quadricep, the percentage of force relative to its maximum that it could generate at that joint angle is probably a lot lower than if you're doing a, a row, right? Like that, that kind of concept of what, what are we defining failure as what percentage of force and relative to its capacity can that muscle generate? I think there's a lot of fuzziness that goes along in this in terms of the experiences that we're relating in our minds. But I guess, I guess the thing I would say is that there's a potential benefit to training closer to failure, all the way to failure, et cetera, that somebody should consider. And then there's these negative effects that you need to try to identify to know when to diverge away from that. And just understanding that's an iterative process that isn't just de facto in either way that failure is good all the time or not failure 
is good all the time. And there's a little bit of fuzziness on the individual level that are ultimately going to determine these decisions. I think that's really the key out of this entire conversation. And then depending on the individual, you know, their training experiences, the anecdotes they have of what's successful. I'm sure tons of low volume to failure bodybuilding coaches are probably the first variable they're looking at when someone plateaus is, all right, are you really going to failure? Like that's probably the, 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 the tool that they're going to first, right? Whereas, you know, somebody that is maybe more on the kind of the, the recent kind of volume side of things, maybe that's kind of the the approach that they're going to go to first. And there's probably not a right or wrong way to go about that. It's just understanding the the signs and, and signals that may tell us to pull one of those levers on the individual level. And I think trying to, you know, for, for anybody looking for stuff to do, I think trying to find tools for the, for that process for an individual, that's the, that's the really the key thing here to kind of figure out which lever to pull when we have so many, um, that all kind of influence one another, like you guys have already described. So, so yeah, I'm, I'm on board fatigue's a thing. It's just, how do we measure it? How do on the, on a day-to-day level when we're doing bicep curls, how do we know when it's a problem? That's the, that's the tough question that we all have to, you know, sit and think about. Yeah, I think that that kind of comes to the question that I had uh, drawn up before, whereas Mike talked about this stimulus to fatigue ratio, essentially, that's kind of what we're talking about here in terms of kind of does that change under certain certain circumstances. So Mike mentioned coming out of like, I don't know, an active rest week one, is the stimulus fatigue ratio of like training a bit further from failure, a wise move for the fatigue versus going straight to failure and then being like totally beat up for days on end. So you can't train again or doing failure work later within your workout or within your working week even or like you said zach on squats maybe you don't go to failure but on some of your rowing movements or your pull pull downs like it makes more sense because of kind of the the fatigue associated with it or people talk about isolation based movements versus not Um, i don't know if mike you have any kind of strong thoughts apart from obviously you mentioned through the mesocycle maybe starting a, a bit further away from failure and then advancing that over the weeks do you have any other thoughts in terms of using failure or proximity to failure and getting the best like stimulus fatigue uh, between maybe like compounds isolations or within workouts yeah yeah those are great questions um i think that the method of training that i espouse and i just espouse it as here's an interesting thing i think works i don't say other methods are necessarily inferior is you start at relatively low volumes in your mesocycle fewer sets than you would do on average you start at two to four reps away from failure ish and every session you put a little more load on the bar or you add a repetition to each set and you automatically get closer to failure and to failure at some point it's it's not possible otherwise because you would just continue to get stronger forever and that if at any point you are healing way ahead of schedule for your next session, like, oh, I trained biceps Monday and they're not on Thursday, not, not up until Thursday. And by Tuesday, I could literally tell you, you pay me a hundred dollars. I can do the exact same bicep workout over and still PR. Like, what is, why is it that we're waiting for Thursday? Is something magical with the fractional synthetic rate literature? We're like, no, nah, that's like 36 hours. He's definitely, you could just train Monday, Wednesday, Friday. You don't need to train, uh, wait until Thursday and, or, you know, changing frequency, Changing volume on the fly in a program is much easier than changing frequency because changing frequency is changing the whole fucking program. So you say, okay, I did three sets of bicep curls and that clearly just didn't fuck me up enough. Uh, I could do more and definitely recover by next time. So next week, maybe I'll do four. And that sort of two factor progression model, the training quality is established by RIR and good technique. And then the training amount is established by volume alterations. And oftentimes the RIR just does all the work. So you don't even have to raise the volume. You start with three sets, three RIR. You end with three sets, zero RIR. And it's exactly as stimulative as you wanted the entire time. I think that progression model checks a lot of the boxes of like you start easy, go hard. You're not uh, ever training uh, uh, to failure except for like at the very end of your meso, but you're never not training to failure at all. So you're completely unmoored from reality of how easy uh, or how hard you could be training. It's got the progressive element. It's got all the good stuff. But aside from that, and let you want to try that system, it's great. It's I think it's a great system, but it doesn't leave you with a lot of room to experiment because it's the same system every single time. And, uh, you know, it's one thing we do, don't do it RP as dogma. So it'd be terrible if we're like, yeah, like every time people like, yeah, man, I train the RP way, part of me, like, hey, great. And a part of me, like, ah, shit, there's no such thing. God damn it. We're just dogmatists at this point. So another idea is to try this as a beginner, 
number one focus should be technique. And I will take that to the grave. And don't you worry about our RAR. Just go hard. Try to put a little more weight on the bar each time and just master excellent technique. Beginner gains are easy as fuck anyway. In the first couple of years of training, you'll get jacked one way or another. And if you don't, sorry, your genetics suck. Such that if you change a lot of variables, you probably still won't get jacked. Uh, the harsh truths of, of reality. As an intermediate, it may behoove you to play with failure. It may behoove you because now you have a really good technique. You can really grind to failure and not lose your technique. Maybe that's as an intermediate where you experiment with seeing how far you can push yourself to failure, even consistently through a mesocycle, and to try to figure out how much volume you can survive pushing like that. And you'll get an appreciation for the kind of results you get and the kind of downsides you experience, like how are your joints, how is your mental state, et cetera, et cetera. Then as an intermediate turning more into an advanced individual, as second half of intermediate, you might want to come back and try RIR again. Try starting with three RIR and just overloading in, in minuscule ways over the course of a mesocycle and see how your perception of your results and the process is going. If you try it and for whatever muscles you tried it with, back to RIR, you're like, man, like I'm cranking my volume. It's pissing away a lot of time in the gym. I'm not getting better pumps. I'm not getting more sore. I'm not progressing faster in strength. Fuck that. Then great. You know, like you can handle failure training and it seems to be the best thing for you. Whereas if you try our training and you're like, dude, everything is just going so much better. And after I go to failure one fucking time at the end of my mesa, I blow, I just completely am a wreck. So if I did that from day one, which I did that two months ago and it fucking ruined me, fuck that. I'm RIR for life. Fuck failure. I've tried it. That's where, that's the boat I'm in. That's not the boat everyone's in necessarily. And then when you become an advanced lifter, six or seven years into your career, you know so well your own responses that when someone comes to the gym and they're like, should you take that to failure like, bup, bup, shut up dummy because you don't know how much volume i did last week you don't know how much volume i'm doing now you don't know how, how fatiguing this exercise makes me i do you don't know the positive positive to benefit ra bene oh, good god positive to negative ratio of what i get out of failure in what context and then like other other people like i'll do some lift and i'll basically get to failure in week one and, and people on the internet will be like i thought you preached no failure in week one we're like well, yes but that's on average some lifts like calf raises like, yeah, I'm like one RIR at all times with calf raises. The fuck wouldn't I be? Uh, I don't accumulate a lot of systemic fatigue from calf raises, believe it or not. But if it's like squats, it's like if you get to one RIR in squats, you probably made a big mistake or you can handle failure training well. And you've run through that topography of I bias a little bit more to RIR and higher volumes. I bias a little bit more towards going all the way to failure, close to failure with lower volumes. I've tried both of them enough times to be able to see one of three things. Uh, the volume RAR method is better for me, the failure method is better for me, or actually if I rig enough variables, they're right about the same. It's just potato, potato, which is totally possible and maybe the case for most people. They either lean into the failure more, they lean into volume more, the stimulus cup fills the same amount. And because extra volume does cause more fatigue, and if you're not a person that gets crazy fatigued by failure, stimulus to fatigue ratio is the same. It's just about trying both. What I would really hate for someone to do is what I did go eight fucking years training everything multi-set to failure. And you, I was fucking Arthur Jones. Oh my God, bro. I was you know, doing the whole objectivist shit where it's like if anything other than one set to failure is arbitrary. It's fun philosophically when you discover that even one set to failure is arbitrary. That tends to fuck with hit people a lot. Um, and I, I did that. I dogmatically did it. And when I flipped the script in like one week in the year 2006 or some shit, I started at 2RIR and I just got like these fucking unreal gains for months and months and years and years. And I was plateaued the fuck out. And I was like, God damn it. So I just wish I had tried a different method. And there are no doubt people of the opposite that have been like, you know, babying themselves to like, you know, what, 40 sets of back. Motherfuck, fuck you. You ain't doing 40 sets of back. Do 40 sets of real back. And you watch them do it. You push them on every set. And after five sets, they're like, dude, I'm going to die. And you're like, wow, no worries. Only 35 sets less according to your program. They're like, blah, 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 blah. hold on. I don't do my sets like this. That's Jared Feather's experience is he trains a ton of IFB pros and he's like, you go to failure. They're like, yeah, he's like, okay, I'm trained with me. And they go in the leg press and they stop and he's like three more. And they're like, what? They get this deer in the head like, look like, but, but that, that failure, and no, no, failure is a word you're saying. It's not something you're doing. Go again. And they go again and again and again. And then they're, like, they're bleeding out of their face. They've thrown up three times a trash can. We're not so sure we want to kill someone on YouTube. So we're like, okay, uh, the workout's over. Just three sets of leg press guys. That's all it took. If you've never explored that end, absolutely explore it. Cause you could save yourself a ton of time in the gym and trying to feel is just way more fun. 
It's way hardcore and it's fucking dope. And if you want the shot at that title, amazing. Just don't train in ways that seem to not with an experimental design of I try this, then I try this, then I try this, then I try that. Try to to get some wisdom for your own body from that so that you know, listen, for me, what seems to work best is this. And I mean seems because I'm never 100% sure. But if I've gotten hurt three times trained to failure and I've gotten hurt zero times and gotten better gains not to failure, I'm in versus the other way around, which is true, no doubt for many people. I think that makes a lot of sense is again trying to kind of avoid the pendulum swing of one end to the other end and kind of finding that mix of what works well for you at least something i'd been experimenting with kind of similar to the calves i like found like eric was talking about never getting sore my calves i can't remember the last time they really got sore and i was just experimenting with length and partials and just taking them all to the house almost like every week and it's just like hey they just keep recovering like basically the next day and so i'm like rather than just yanking on that volume lever i was like hey let's just yank on the the intensity a little bit more but if i did that for quads as an example like you guys said on the leg press it's just hell like a couple of sets even three rr like that's very very challenging work and i think that's something some people get wrong is they hear three reps in reserve and they think easy and i think all of us here know three reps in reserve it isn't easy any exercise you don't get any gains from easy training you have to cause an overload of stress and something for you eric i don't know if you can quickly clear up for us because it's often an argument of why you shouldn't use reps and reserve is because people aren't good at approximating that for themselves. So I'd love to hear your kind of thoughts on that. Yeah. Um, people are on average when studied pretty damn good at it, um, actually. And, uh, the way that that's been studied is multi multi varied and it's important to discuss how, uh, real briefly, the most common method is you'll have someone go to failure on a set motivated and allowed the same kind of environment Mike was talking about. And they'll call out when they think they're at certain RIRs, typically the top of a squat before they go back back down, top of a leg press before they come back down or chest press or bench press. Uh, That's by far the vast majority of the data that we have on this. And then we just look at the difference between when they actually hit failure and when they thought they were only one rep away, right? So if they go, I got one more left and they get two more, then they have an RIR inaccuracy of one. And when that has been meta-analyzed by Halperin and when that has been experimentally tested um, quite recently, actually, in a few of the people's labs we've been talking about, most notably FAU, as well as Martin Ruffalo at Deakin, who I'm working with, uh, and then um, also doing it at uh, AUT, where I've done the research. In trained people, uh, the error typically is less than one. So on average, people are less than one rep off. Um, and there does seem to be an interesting bias where they are typically under predicting, uh, which is kind of different than what you think on Instagram. People are kind of showing their ego, you know, like, yeah, I got two more. It's like, yeah, that was a complete failure actually. Um, so it's pretty damn accurate. And I think for the audience we're speaking to, I'm very confident in saying like people listening to revive stronger and taking training anecdotes home are probably as accurate as people in the studies. Um, where it is probably less accurate would be in out in the wild. You know, the person who's doing doing these lap pull downs, you know, where they kind of do the little tricep push down at the end and they get up and they're like, right, yes, whoop. Eric, that's my that's favorite exercise to observe <laughs> in the gym. It, it begs the question of what is it that you're training? And, and the answer is a good answer. They're just working out. They're not training. You're the yeah, weird one out. who lives in the gym. They have a family and a career and everything. They're just there to move stuff around. It's shoulder extension. Then you do a little internal rotation and then you Healthy. do a tricep push down. It's, it's a whole, whole body exercise. Yeah. Exactly. And you get up refreshed, feeling fine. Um, so yeah, to answer your question, Steve, pretty damn accurate. Um, although I, I think the interesting thing here is um, there's a big difference between failure and different movements, which I just want to reiterate that point from before, like uh, going to failure on a cable row and taking a strict interpretation of I'm going to not change my back angle and I only count the rep when my when my palm touches my abs like you're not going to get sore from that. It's not going to feel hard. You're just going to be like, I can't get it there. Okay. Well, sweat, sick. I did my, my zero RIR cable row. But then if you just like kept going until you could only get 50% of the rep, you probably would get sore and you'd almost double your reps. And that was kind of a, a new experience and awareness for me when I started thinking about the length and partial stuff, not fully new, but um, like I, I thought about that, but when I didn't think failure mattered, mattered that much and I combined that with length and partial data. And now I'm like, you know, there's probably specific muscle groups, specific exercises where this does matter a lot more and it kind of changes the overall uh, perspective. Like when you think about like, where is it 
challenging to go to failure. You think of like leg exercises and pressing, you know, it's very clear because you're weakest in the, in the start, you know, you, you try to go to failure. It's pretty obvious. Hey, I couldn't do it because it stopped like, meh, meh, you know? So I think that's interesting. I think there's maybe more potential out of um, the, the kind of new wave of research looking at uh, failure and looking at uh, the point of failure and the point of changing the range of motion and doing it in a lengthened position for certain muscle groups and not others, you know, your back work, some other, you, you know, calves, things like, things like that. So I think we have to understand there's a lot of interaction of variables and for people who want to explore this, I think Mike gave, gave some great advice. And if I may, I have a really simple way. And he mentioned like, if you change your frequency, you're changing your whole program. But I actually have experimented with just taking a very, very simple template and then manipulating one thing and seeing how it impacts the performance and the time course. And that's basically going, take a low to moderate upper lower and just do them without any set days. Just go upper, lower, upper, lower, upper, lower. And then an easy way you can adapt that is, all right, I'm going to do that to failure for a while with my current exercises. I'm going to do six to eight sets per muscle group. Am I ready in 48 hours to do upper again? If you're not, like you're not healing on time, okay, then I got to push that out. And maybe you're getting three days per, I mean, I think on the low end, someone doesn't recover well, six to eight sets to failure on upper or lower body session. They might only be able to train three days per week, you know? So it's like their frequency is like 1.5 per week or whatever, you know? And they're kind of on the low end. They're getting like nine to 11 sets on average per week. Someone who recovers quite well, they might be able to go upper, lower, off, upper, lower, you know, like kind of like that. And now they're getting another bump in volume. And then run that for a while, see how you do, see how long it takes you to need a deload, see how you like it, see which exercises just are really not conducive to that setup. And you're like, you know what? I got to get this, uh, this one out of there. I'm going to swap it in for this. Um, and then repeat the experiment months later, because it's going to take some time to really get a good feel for that. And do your first set of the three RIR, second set of the two RIR, last set of and a one RIR. If you got a four set, maybe take the, your last set of your last exercise for that session to failure and then see, all right, does that drastically change or noticeably change? It doesn't need to be drastic. How frequently I can train. And then, of course, performance, outcomes, visual changes, et cetera. Um, that's actually the story of how I landed on my current training split where I don't really restrict myself to any given muscle group per day. I found that I could accumulate more training volume per muscle group uh, at a higher intensity with more frequency, which was just the same way I found I could accumulate more volume per week. Same thing, right? If I can train a muscle group more often with the same volume and I'm still recovering higher intensity by not having an upper lower split and having kind of like free range. So it, I call it full body, but I think that really gives people a, an inaccurate impression that I'm doing every single muscle group every, every single day. I'm not. I'm just repeating muscle groups when they're ready to be trained again. And that resulted in me getting a whole lot more volume, not a whole lot more. I got a quarter more volume to be objective about it. And I was just as recovered and I was still training with a similar or, or greater proximity to failure. And I was able to do it for longer before I had a deload. That experiment I exact talk, talk, talked about playing with upper lower and then playing with repeating full body. And then I was like, well, I can take the same concept. Like I'm just gonna train a muscle group when it's ready. And that's how I landed upon that. So I think you you can you can take some of those uh, very simple approaches like that and just modulate. Okay, let's try that to failure. Let's try it short of failure. Is there a difference? And you can find out like in Mike's kind of archetypes. Are you somebody who falls along like, oh wow, I I go to failure and there's a massive increase in my time course of recovery, or it's a small change, but I feel like my quality of training is better. Or maybe you can do both relatively frequently, but when you go to failure, you've got a deload you know, way more frequently. And you can just then, once you've gone through that experimental process, you can be like, all right, so which one do I think was a better gimme for the gotcha or vice versa? And I think that's that's a relatively simple way that someone can probably go through this process and figure out where they individually fall. Yeah, I like that. It reminds me of 
I made a really stupid thread. I think it was something along these lines. It was like bodybuilding is like trying to train as hard as often, sorry, as hard as you can, as often as you can, as much as you can for as long as you can. It's like, that sounds really maybe simple on paper, but like there's a lot of ways to go about trying to achieve such a thing. Um, like just training as hard as you can today is not going to achieve that and trying to do it tomorrow. Like we've talked about like the accumulative fatigue and all these different variables. So I think this is the final question I've got though. Thank you for that, Eric, is um, to you, Zach, in terms of talking about any decent tools to help your clients regulate their volume or relative intensity how do you decide what intensity and volume to start training with and what helps you modify that over time i know we've spoken about that in general and mike spoke about that at length in how he likes to do it did you have anything different to mike or anything to add no i mean i think we've in different you know sectors of the conversation i think we've nailed pretty much all the things you would utilize but i guess to try to distill it down um in an answer I guess ultimately the thing you're trying to do is, is we've all kind of said the terminology, kind of an optimization game. There's kind of a window where the most productive training happens and we're trying to maximize the dosage of that training without, you know, over fatiguing ourselves such that we can't do that for a long time. That's ultimately what you're trying to accomplish. The guys just mentioned both approaches that they like to utilize to kind of do that in some sort of systematic fashion, other over weeks, over months, over years, even. Um, and I think that's ultimately what you're trying to, to, to do. And I think the, the, the challenging things t- to me is when you're trying to think about some sort of, I think, I think, uh, it was colored in the guy's answer. That I think a lot of their intuitions were, were built into kind of, you know, when you know, kind of thing. And I think from a systematic, very clear answer for a listener, it gets hard because, you know, there's a lot of middle ground that can happen in that answer that, that I think there's a ton of really good like training configurations that people could land on in the middle of those kind of answers that I I think it comes down to the fact that there probably is more than one road to Rome here. And I think that's something to sit and really like understand because it, then you avoid paralysis by analysis and, and thinking you have to, you know, optimize this down to, well, I do one RIR for two sets. And then I do, you know, uh, momentary failure, but not length and partials on my third set. And then my, you know, that kind of, that kind of situation, you probably don't want to go down that road and understand there's probably a ton of different, uh, configurations that are going to be beneficial. Ultimately, the 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 two important principles that to keep in mind is that there does seem to be some sort of relationship with proximity to failure. So we should be training pretty hard a lot of the time. The finer executions of that is going to be up to the individual. And I think the you know the the, the couple intuition things that I I think you can kind of look towards is is those kind of performance losses set to set. I think there's probably something there. If I had to guess, if that's to me, that's the best explanation of that intuition of kind of what does it mean to not be ready to train a muscle group in 48 hours? To me, that's, you know, the, the performance on the first set, like Mike kind of talked about of being able to even remotely match your performance or exceed it. That's kind of the, the, the get into the session in a good spot. And then to have a really high performing session to me is to, you know, whatever that, that kind of benchmark kind of set repetition combo, RAR combo, whatever it is, trying to be around that a lot of the time, as opposed to having massive losses in performance. And I think for some people that's going to be, you know, for, you know, for me, Steve, we're kind of talking off air. I've been gracious enough. We've got a tonal machine at the the lab we just recently got, and those are really cool if everybody hasn't got a chance to use it. But um, I've been doing a lot of my kind of back training with like eccentric overload and every single set to, length and partial kind of failure. And for me that I can maintain performance relatively well for those across a few sets, but that could just be me. And that could be isolated to certain movements in this very specific setup, et cetera, context, blah, blah, blah. And so that the point is, that's kind of the thing I I would say, that's probably something to look for is that, you know, if I kind of look at this session, just even subjectively, like, do I think a lot of this training that I'm doing is relatively high performance relative to what I'm capable of on that given session. And if there's a massive loss in quality, that's where we kind of probably should start thinking about um, manipulating one of these variables. Which one should I pull first? I think that's where we need direct evidence to kind of compare these two archetypal approaches and see on average, which one of them seems to lead to, you know, maybe more efficient outcomes even. Um, That would probably be the answer of which of them to pull first. I don't think we have that data yet, really. But on the individual level, that's probably what I'm looking for is that, you know, within a session, if my performance is massively decreasing, maybe I should cut a few sets off so that decreases and as far and come back and perform some of those sets later in my next session. Or 
that entire kind of training volume under the curve, changed the RER formulation there a little bit to try to, you know, rescue some of that performance and not have a ton of it drop off. Um, because there does seem to be an extent to which that matters. A little bit of performance reduction, obviously, is just part of hard training. And that's probably just a tax that kind of comes along with doing the thing that we don't need to be super scared of. But if it gets excessive, obviously, that's when we want to step in and, and, and try to make some modifications. So I'd say at the moment, I don't have any very clear numbers or anything. Um, but that to me is kind of the kind of taking everybody's answers and trying to put them in as systematic of a picture as possible. That's kind of, to me, what everybody said. Yeah, I think that was very well said. It actually reminds me of a, um, acronym you use, Eric. It's, I f- I'm going to forget exactly what it's, what each letter stands for, but it was ref. So it was ref yourself, realistic, enjoyable. I can't remember the last one. I would not want to say baby. fun, but was it fun? <laughs> Flexible. But, Flexible, that's the one. I was like, enjoyable is the same as uh, fun. Why would I so flexible? So I, th- I don't know. It reminds me of that in terms of like, as long as it's a principle-based program, it's got realistic, enjoyable, it's flexible to a certain degree. Like that's going to allow a lot of people to progress really well. And I kind of want to make sure to leave the listeners where they might have listened to all of this. They still, like, still feel I don't know, anxious, confused, lost. They want this optimal program. And it's like, hey, like everyone's just here described, like don't be dogmatic, try a few things out, make sure your training is generally hard and you're doing sufficient amounts of it. You feel like, hey, you're getting beat up, but not super beat up and try and make it progressive over time. And you're you're probably going to land upon something that's really, really good. And it will probably change over time as well. <laughs> as you advance, you get stronger and these things happen and you'll probably get a better intuition about your body and how you're progressing and all those things too which i think is valuable as well i think all of us can say that about the kind of accumulative fatigue and you just kind of know that that's occurring if even if we don't have good data to necessarily support all of that so guys i want to say a massive thank you i don't know if anyone has anything in addition they want to add to this discussion but i think you guys did a fantastic job of kind of answering all the questions that we had there and uh getting to the, the crux of the goal of the discussion as well so thank you awesome pleasure and a privilege I will make sure that everyone's information is linked in the description so you can follow these guys on social media, listen to their podcasts or when they're on different podcasts. And uh, I just highly recommend following all these guys because they're incredibly intelligent. And hopefully you guys really enjoyed this and we'll catch you on the next one. Cheers. Losing weight fast while maintaining muscle mass. Sounds too good to be true, doesn't it? It isn't though, it's reality and we know how to do it. And we will help you achieve this. The Mini Cup Movement is an eight week fat loss program to make you lose a huge chunk of fat while maintaining muscle mass at the same time. We will support you from the beginning to the end so that you see the results you would like to and come out of it much stronger. You will receive a fully automated spreadsheet that is based on your nutritional needs. You can choose between six different male and female training templates. Over 30 videos will guide you through each and every single step of the mini cup so that you're getting the most out of your journey and that you always know what to do. But the best thing is that you can start whenever you want. The mini cup movement is open 24 seven. So if you want to learn more or you're ready to sign up, hit the link in the description below. So let's revive stronger together.